Good evening, guys. Ken at Tortoise Capital Nightly Strategy Podcast for November 29th, 2022. Uh, I had received a question in an email during a coaching session about realistic gains per week. Um, and what I just want to lay out is our documented live trading workshops from the years uh, 2009 to 2019. The patterns we were using are basically the same patterns that we're using today. Some slightly different names, but the same market classification, target identification, uh, risk management, uh, ruthless risk management, uh, intraday framing, and so forth. I think we're, I think our patterns are better now and uh, stricter on execution. But still, this is representative of this style of trading. To be fair, after 25 years of effort, um, this is how we manufacture R. So in those 11 years, I think we did uh, 14 live workshops. They were typically three or four days long. There were a couple that were five, but we I, most of them were like four. And uh, we had about... Um, about 100 trades per week, which is about 20 to 25 a day. And our total was 1,467 trades. Uh, the single big, biggest winner we had was 11.2. Uh, we had a couple trades that were minus 2R. There were only two. Uh, those were trades where we had kept the position uh, overnight, we kept a fraction overnight, and there was an adverse gap. So there you are. Um, the there were 876 winning trades, 370 losing trades, 221 scratch trades, which we defined as a loss uh, or a gain of about uh, minus 0.2 or plus 0.2. So those tended to uh, just cancel out because there were some that were micro wins, some were micro losses. Uh, and that gives us about a 60% win rate, about a 25% uh, losing rate. So that's about 2 to 1 win rate to lose rate if you just round up. And the average win was uh, 1R, and the average loss was 0.4R. So that's about a 2.5 to 1 uh, payoff ratio, which gives you a pretty favorable uh, payoff and expectancy. The um, uh, the expectancy over all those was 0.48, with a standard deviation of 0.95. If you run it as an SQN 100, that has an SQN of about five, because that number of trades is so large. If you multiply by the square root of n times the, no, you get a. Uh, NSQN of 19, which I think uh, I don't put as much credence in that as I do in this one. Uh, what I pay more attention to is the distribution of trades in the production schedule and the uh, slope of the equity curve, and most importantly, the histogram. So there were a couple trades that were worse than minus one. But from minus 1 to plus 2, you have a normalish looking curve that is positive expectancy, and you have fat right tails. So if you have uh, 100 trades a week, and your expectancy is, uh, is 0.4, uh, that's going to give you 40R a week. If you then take my advice and you set each one of those execution R's to 0.2 position sizing, you end up dividing that. That gives you an 8R target for routine day trading. And so my goal is to have 2R position sizing gains each week with not unreasonable expectation of 8. But it's hard to sustain 
that level of effort every day for four to five days a week. And there are days there are days off and other things that I'm doing. Uh, but in my view, a two R two position sizing or a week, or in other words, ten execution R per week, if you're trading five days a week, is certainly achievable. And that gives you a intraday target of netting two execution R a day. So I would be aiming for like like five execution R or four and then settle for two. And then you could achieve that and you could achieve that. And then with proficiency, there's an opportunity to grow into that. If you understand math, then you're going to understand what I just said. If you don't understand what I just said, you have some work to do to build an edge using basic statistics and a mindset of industrial production. That's what industrial production looks like over an 11 year period. And I think we're better now. Uh, quick look, I was uh, taking a look at semiconductors today as a sector. Um, I went back to like six months and I'm looking at um, the purple line. This is this is all scaled on a percent return over that six six month period. And Texas Instruments is here. Uh, Nvidia was the most volatile, and that's the red line. You can see uh, Nvidia starts up here as a leader, comes all the way down as one of the laggards, and then moves back up into second place. And then you can see that the size of those moves are considerable and getting larger. And so I consider NVIDIA the most volatile. Um, Intel right now is the weakest, has the most ground to make up. Uh, Texas Instruments, to me, that's the purple line, was the most resilient in that it has stayed at the top consistently, has had the least drawdowns. Uh, the the swings are not as vigorous, but in terms of a, you know, positioning against peers, Texas Instruments has a lot to offer. AMD, Advanced Micro, to me, had the best uh, short-term swings when I'm taking a look at this move off the bottom to that far, that's a that's a 20% move. That was the single biggest uninterrupted swing. So AMD seems to have some sh short-term volatility, and then uh, Marvel, MRVL, which is the um, let's see the dark blue. That's this one, is the one that is beloved by analysts, and part of that is that they love it because it had a harsh sell-off and still has yet to recover back to the heights where it once was. So on the basis of that implied potential, uh, Marvel has really been uh, beloved by some analysts. So as I take a look at the semiconductor, there, there really is reason to pay attention to the individual components of a sector when you see that kind of differentiation uh, in performance that you can actually uh, get rewarded for paying a little attention. So that's my that's my quick look at uh, semis. Um, <clears throat> uh, Luis asked, were those swing trades? The only swing trades in that stack uh, were the two, two R losses. It was monkeying around with, you know, we had a really strong intraday move and a symbol and then kept 20% over the overnight. And in both of those cases, there was a adverse gap, which gave us a two R loss on the swing trade. The market classifications are irrelevant. Although you can go back and take a look at the, um, uh, those are all recorded by the way, every single trade. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if I'd say the market classification was irrelevant, but there was a mix of all kinds of markets. There were some, uh, I can remember when my wife came to one and she was trading the frog 
and we had the four largest consecutive one-day ranges ever. They were in different direct. One was up, one was down, another was down, another was up. And the size of those four individual day moves were extraordinary. So there was a mix of all those different kinds. And that establishes my point that on shorter-term trading, the long-term market classification does not really matter. But if it did matter, you would prefer to be in volatile conditions like this whole year has been. Oh, yeah, those are about 99% intraday trades because we were learning patterns and we were uh, live trading each day. And it doesn't make sense to fly around the world to come to a live trading workshop to manage swing trades because then what do you do after you spend five minutes a day managing your swings? What do you do? Well, I mean, we in Kansas City, we go out and eat barbecue and walk along the river and play drums. But uh, the, the point of those live trading workshops was really to drill down into intraday trading. And it, we featured one minute, three minute, five minute, 10 minute, some 30 minute bars, some hourly bars. But, you know, 95 percent of the focus was on on day trading. Now, we also did some swing trading. But those are not reflected in here unless it was part of a day trade that was continued overnight. Um, I kept separate stats on the uh, swing trade uh, workshops, which we were typically doing online uh, over six to eight week periods. Uh, I've, I'll go find those stats, too. They're pretty good as well. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we typically were doing those live workshops like Monday through Friday, and then the previous Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we were going over techniques, rehearsals, uh, the weekend report, learning how to set it, set up our trading plans, uh, rehearse our trading plans um, uh, on Sunday night, and then Monday morning hitting it fresh with everybody in the room uh, working together as a team. And there was some pretty powerful stuff. So we've got all that stuff recorded um, and uh uh, I could be persuaded to make those available. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, let's go to the, uh, I don't know, Griff. Uh, I'm, uh, those are, li live trading on Zoom to me is very distracting. Um, I, I don't really like it. I, I enjoyed the intraday in person. Uh, when travel becomes a little more feasible, I've had some folks that were interested. We, we may do one of those uh, next summer. We'll, we'll see. All right, so here's the uh, sniper trade of the day. This is in uh, Brazil. All right, so... Uh, let's, uh, Mike, check. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So here was the, uh, OR3. Uh, this was a breakout out of the OR3 with a standard risk box. You know, uh, in retrospect, I, I feel like I got a little sloppy here. Whoops. Let's see. Uh, this this was a legitimate exit right here to lock that in. Um, but the rest of the market was sinking, and this was doing okay. And so I just I left it on. Um but then the second time that it couldn't break, it could not break above. And uh, the R10, RL10 came through the dragon. I took that exit for about one R. Uh, 
I should also say that if if you do get out here, that's legit. This should get you back in. So the amount that you get back out of that one hour is, is that. And then you would still take that exit. Um, what would we call this second entry here? Cot of two. The, the essence of the cot of two is that after a sell-off and you have this pattern of higher lows and uh, you have, uh, you're on the favorable side of the dragon. The, the dragon acts as a buffer to, to this downside down here. This dragon, once you cross over that thing, uh, this is acting as a, as a buffer. And so you can see here, when the R10 comes through the dragon, you no longer have the protection of the buffer. And in fact, that dragon is pushing you down. But when it can't push you down and price jumps back across the dragon, even though that distance between those two points is very small, it's the width of the dragon, and that's your noise buffer. That little buffer right in between, if we were to color that dragon in. I've actually tried this where I've taken the, you know, on the screen, and then made that, dra that thick dragon a solid color so you can't even see price inside there, and it forces you to see which side of the dragon price is on that's actually a pretty powerful technique so when you if you if we were to color that in you can now see the difference i hope between uh, you have this higher low in the dragon when it came through that's the reason to get out here and that's when it's on the far side of the dragon that's the reason to get back in that's what makes it a cot of two. Now, if this price keeps uh, keeps rolling like this, and you keep getting these higher lows, I still call those cot of twos. As long as on this little pullback, it that price never came down and violated the previous low, because then you would no then then that support level is gone because it just got breached, and that would be the end of the K2s. But as long as you've got these rising lows in the belly of the dragon, or you can use the belly of the RL10 for that analysis, I just consider all those caught of twos. What you want to see is that great big sell-off that creates the condition for the SSC, and when that crosses the dragon... takes out the PSR, that's where you get the, the first one is the SSC, supported spring crossing, because this was a harsh winter. And you have heard me say about 10,000 times, find the movers. The SSC forces you to find the movers. Well, what do you mean? Oh, I mean that the harsh winter, this abnormal harsh sell-off establishes the fact that this thing is moving. It's moving. It had an abnormal move in this direction. So you're giving them the first move. And then what you hope to see is that that was an exaggeration, and all this is going to do on your first leg is just to come back to the previous breakdown level. That's why we call this the tactical space. In the tactical space, all I'm trying to do is get my risk out. If my risk was here, what I'm trying to do is get my stop above that so I can lock in that gain. That's all I'm trying to do in the tactical space. It doesn't get interesting until it breaks above that previous hump. When that broke out with higher lows, this was the least surprising result. It's like the lid gets blown off that pressure cook. Hey, here were 10 bars when it could not break above that previous support level.
or resistance level, excuse me. In fact, it got weaker and it rejected, but now it makes a higher low. So that means that the buyers are coming in at this price level instead of this level. So they're not, they don't think it's going to come back all the way down here. They're in a sense of urgency to buy that. So when these guys come in and start buying it here, it pops it up here. It crosses the dragon. And that's what makes this such a good entry. This entry right here is a very good entry because it's on the north side of the dragon and you had those higher lows. It took out the previous statistical resistance levels of the RL10, which is equivalent to the PSAR flip. When that breaks, you get this relief rally and off it goes. So this combines a failure to fail back to previous support levels and it takes out the previous resistance level. That is the lowest risk entry that you ever saw. And so on this big long sell-off, it's not impossible to see six or seven or eight of those Kata 2 moments all the way up the scale. So although your best return comes from the SSC entry, because that was the biggest move, you, you are happy to get these Kata 2s because you're just continuing to hit it and hit it and hit it and hit it. And sometimes those little sell-offs will cause you to get out, but when it doesn't take out the previous low and reverses back up, that's where you get that next Kata 2 re-entry. That's what this is. Check or hold. Commit that lesson to permanent memory. So we've got the Kata 2 re-entry, put a standard risk box on it, uh, up it goes, and in the time that it does that, we can move our stop to here. And all we're going to do is lock in that little wedge, that little brick of cheese is our no lose plus dinner for two. Now on this little pullback to here, where I'm really going to be interested in is if it takes out this level. Because by then I will have had almost one and a half R in hand. But for right now, I'm just content to let it monkey around in this space. Because I've, I've taken my risk out because I've got a little piece. And out at the PSAR. Locking in basically a, that's about a 0.4, check or hold. Now this is where uh, it gets interesting from an analysis point of view, if you, if you find this stuff interesting. This, what was once a resistance level, which when broken gave us our entry on the Kata 2, because remember this failed this failed but now it broke through and gives us this run look the size of that move was the size of that move symmetry and then it comes back and then what was once resistance is now support and notice in here how the r10 is monkeying around right here while it's trying to decide what to do so in an in a way of thinking you could Put your you take this standard risk box here, bracket that, and now you can play a breakout if you want from that from that region. We would call that uh, a Z3P. So now this is this is getting interesting right here. This is a legitimate uh, short signal right now. Why? Because you have a high. You can see that lower high is developing. You've got a clear PSAR downward push. You wouldn't be surprised if it moved to here and held support. And if that broke, you wouldn't be surprised if it got to here 
and held support. And if that broke, you wouldn't be surprised if it came to the opening of the day and held support. And if that broke, you would want to be all over that thing. So you've got some wedges and potential gains. And if you compare that to the size of the standard risk box, and you put that standard risk box on this and called that short, you'd be something like this, wouldn't you? Legitimate. Just because you framed it, do you have to take it? No, you don't have to do anything. If you had taken this short, and then it reverses up and takes out the PSAR and cross the dragon, you should be able to see that this projected potential downward move of three legs to Tesla lower day, that didn't happen. We would call that failure to fail further. Failure to fail further is information. And in fact, this is a Kata 2 signal to the long side. So we've already made the case why Kata 2 is such a good entry. So in the face of a short side trade, which is not working, and the trade to the other side gets a very good entry, is there any reason to believe in this trade? No. Is there ever a reason to believe in a trade? No. So you neither have to believe or disbelieve. Your belief has nothing to do with what the price is going to do. Price should drive your decision making, not your beliefs. What you do is you let your science and your craft determine what your rules are that you can live with because you've studied thousands of trades. And you let the price do the thinking. So if you take this short position and you take this standard risk box, your risk box would have been something like that. But you already know at the moment of entry that an adverse price move to here would get you out of that trade. So you're really only risking that much. You're risking one third of the minimum manageable risk box. That's a low risk trade. So you're entitled to take that trade. But you must also be ready to instantly get out right there so you can go long and take the trade that you're supposed to trade. Now, one third of an MMRB is so small, that's why I didn't take that trade. But you could have and just eaten a 0.1, a 0.3 loss. That's fine. Absolutely justified. Kata 2, standard risk, check or hold. We would call this space, and I'm going to draw it in orange, this space in here is the tactical space because it's not until it gets above the, the previous PSAR limit that it gets interesting. And the only thing I have to do in the tactical trade space is get my risk is get my risk north of my entry to a level where I can lock in my no lose plus dinner for two wedge. Check or hold. Standard exit. 
standard work. Now, where I'm drawing this black line, uh, you would actually be justified in going short here. Why? Because you notice a high, a low, a lower high. Now you have this pattern. That would make, what would this short entry be here? Collapsing dragon. Because you're getting this kind of function. That looks like a, ser a whole series of kata twos to the downside. So when you're playing that formation, what you do is at the bottom of the previous hump, to get short inside here is a kata two. To get short here or below is a collapsing dragon. So in this case, the kata two is a front run of the collapsing dragon all the way down. So this would be a kata two short. This would be a collapsing dragon. It rolls over, kata two, collapsing dragon. Kata two, collapsing dragon. You decide which one you want to trade. But until that series of lower highs and lower lows is broken, you're just riding that trend downward. That's my favorite pattern all those collapsing dragons. What does it take to go the other way? Uh, an SSC, which was a horrible sell-off, and then it crosses and meets the criteria for the SSC. And then hopefully that SSC is going to give us a series of kata twos all the way up the stack. But it starts with an SSC, and then if it works, it's a series of kata twos. Check or hold. Was that a legitimate kata two? Yes. Why? Higher lows. What would we call this entry to the downside? Collapsing dragon. You might, you might have waited, or I might have waited to hear, that's really a collapsing dragon because of a violation here. Uh, standard risk box. Standard exit. and done for the day. So that's about one, a third, a scratch, about one. So that's about 2.3. That's a daily goal. In order to get your 10 for the week, which translates to two position sizing R for the week. Uh, here's another one. This is Mexico. A frog champion. Here's the OR3. There was the breakout. There's the standard risk box. Instant fail. Minus one. I wait for the crossing of the dragon. Short. Standard risk box. Check or hold.
That's what it's supposed to do right away. What would you call this second entry? Collapsing Dragon. Mexico is a frog champion because of this reason. Call that a standard exit? Yep. Didn't break the PSAR with the RL10, so I get short again. Check or hold? Cotta 2. Down here would be the collapsing dragon. As soon as this crosses the dragon, I, that's a Cotta 2. And why am I interested in front running the Cotta 2 on this one? Or front running the CD with a Cotta 2? Because of that. Very little follow through. Failure to fail further. You see the difference in that price action and this price action? If we get an entry in here, what would we call that? Cotta 2. If I let it come across this blue line and I get an entry in here, I call that an emerging dragon. Nothing wrong with that entry either. So Cotta 2 entry, standard risk box, standard exit. I was probably sloppy late on that one. I don't think it's that sloppy, but there's bar 1, bar 2. That's a 1, 2, 3 exit right here. So I could have gotten out here instead of here. But I still lock in this little piece, which is about 0.4. If that's 1.0, this little wedge is about 0.4. And done for the day. Uh, yeah, could there have been... Maybe it could have gotten more out of that. That was it. You wouldn't have lost money if you had gone the PSR flip. Uh, or if you had waited for like a collapsing dragon, you, you probably would have scratched. So there was still something available in there. Okay. Uh, so that's what that looked like. Um, here's the 30 minute candles for the market. This is the one day move right there. Pretty much just monkeyed around. Didn't fail further. Acts like a little compressing triangle and ready for potential breakout. And that might hold, in which case, those two support levels. Are providing support to here so this break if it does break out of here tomorrow we're entitled to think it could get back into this region before it stalls so there's a potential sharp move in there from about 397 to about 401 so that's about a 1% move
taking a look at 30 days on daily bars. Here's our one day move. The five day look back, the 10 day look back, the 20 day, the 30 day. Here's our 30 day low, 30 day high. If this 10 day holds right here, this is still potential up. But if that 10 day fails, look out below. Let's look at our uh, sector performance. Here's the S&P was down only 0.17. The Qs were weaker at 0.76. Treasuries were worst at 1.17. Tesla minus one, couldn't hold it. Uh, diamonds were a little better than the S&P at zero. And here was the cut line between winning and losing. Uh, the small caps, 0.3, uh, the best performer of the indexes was um, emerging markets, which had a standout stellar day at plus 2%. That's a really significant difference between the U.S. indexes, which were quiet and narrow and weak, and the emerging markets, which were very, very strong. Let's take a look at the underperformers first. So for reference, again, here's the S&P baseline. Discretionary staples, ARC Genomics, ARC Innovation, down to 0.54. Tech, Mexico, minus 1. Uh, VIX, minus 1.46. Individual companies, uh, PayPal and Apple were off over 2%. Microsoft was off 0.6. Um, let's take a look at some of our special. Let's go. Well, let's look at the upside first. Let's look at the, take a look at the top. So, uh, S and P baseline again 0.17. So you've got the Aussie, clean energy, fangs, agriculture, and materials up to 0.34. Here's our cut line. Biotech and finance up a half. Lumber and lumber, 0.9. Wheat and precious metals, oil exploration, ethereum, blended energy, uh, uranium, 1.34. Commercial real estate, residential real estate, Bitcoin and lithium up to 1.7. Then oil in Brazil had the best performances. Here's our metals, Alcoa, U.S. Steel, and Cliff. All were better than the S&P. All were better than their primary uh, ETF. So metals had a good day today. And Alcoa was the best. So be ready for Alcoa tomorrow. In energy, it was the opposite case. You have, uh, no, as, no, energy was upside. So you had Devon, energy, and um, where's my XLE? hidden somewhere. I think he's in here. So Devon Energy was pretty good at 1.4. Now our semis was the other story. So Intel, Texas Instruments, and NVIDIA. Um, NVIDIA, real weakness. Texas Instruments in the middle. Intel, I think, has the best value play. It has more bad news baked into the cake already. So I'll be looking for them tomorrow. All right, let's take a look at the uh, traders today.
Uh, Satya could have been could have been good today. Um, I th I'm not sure what. Okay, that's that's short. So his wrist box was here, not here. Gets a scratch. Uh, he waits for it to. This was where the entry would have been on a PSAR flip. He takes this entry, loses one, re-enters, scratches. Does not take the re-entry. That's the one that pays. This one right here, you got to crush this entry. That's the one. It's Guys, we're in a bare normal market. Tech is weakest. Tesla is under a lot of pressure. That is the signal. This is the signal. That's market. That's the market classification you need. Uh, here's Luke. Harsh winter. PSR flip. Pretty much an SSC. Let's a little bit of it get away. More importantly, gets the short. We could have taken the re entry here and broken even. Might have gotten this one, but that's still pretty good. I think we gave a lot back, but we still got paid. Here's your SSC. Crushes it. Scratches it. 2.6. Very orderly. Agnieszka with the uh, Aussie Canadian, just to keep it fresh, totals 2R. Here's a Kata 2. This is pretty good. Gets paid. This is a good Kata 2. Gets paid. Um, that's a quick exit. Gets Recovers it right here. Flips again and gets 2.7. That's how you do it. That was very nice. That's in a space of a, less than two hours. Gets her 2R. Uh, Nolan. Uh, we got to have that trade. All right, if we're short here, micro loss gets long up in here. We got to be out here instead of here. That's a good short. Uh, I'd like to see you get more of that in order to pay for those two. But still, that's pretty good. This is pretty good. Um, you're probably out of emotional energy by that point, but you got to get this trade. But certainly you got to get it when it crosses the VWAP. When the dragon peeks over the top of this thing, here's your VWAP. When the dragon is underneath it the whole way and does a momentary blip and then dives, you got to get that or here and stay there. Now, it, this, this all scratches because there's no follow through, but that's the one we got to get. Bare normal conditions. Tech is weaker than the market. Tesla under pressure. I like this is out of a sideways quiet channel. Starts trading. Uh, OR3 gets paid. I like the scratch. We missed that. I like the quick exit and then... Oh, Dragon peeks over the the VWAP. We got to crush this. Best best pattern ever. Markets in bare normal. Tech is weaker. Apple is weaker than tech. You got to crush that. The the uh, emotional energy it takes to take that trade 
put that in here and take it the higher probability trade. Bill's working on the book project. This is in Carnival Corporation. Piece our flip to our battle drill automatic entry to our battle drill third entry, fourth entry. RL10 crosses the baby dragon all out. 10R. Three hours. 10 position sizing R. That's the weekly goal in three hours. System that produces low risk routine trades and not so much on the daily R goal, which your goal should be to trade like that. Daily reports. Uh, I had a question, a series of questions from uh, one of our uh, hybrid workshop students. Hey, it looks like Ken doesn't screen for targets. He only trades the things that he always trades, like Brazil and the metal. I trade a lot more things than you see me briefing on these charts. What I'm trying to do is establish that it pays off to focus and specialize on a few symbols while you are learning the patterns. But the reason I go through the daily charts is I know these patterns cold, and I'm looking for lots of things that are ready to move, and I can frame them quickly with the TC2000 bundle, so it doesn't take me any time to frame the trades. I just put them in a watch list, and they're already framed. So when they start moving, I get the alerts, and I quickly dial in, and I know exactly what I'm going to do. All right. Dashboard number one, bearish quiet for a change. Stabilizing did not fail further. We still are justified in a risk on. So this is a very delicate moment. Tesla and Intel are among the weakest. So when Tesla collapses intraday, you got to pile on it. Otherwise, Merck, J.P. Morgan, Pfizer, healthcare, and then Coke and Walmart, Staples. That's where the health is. These aren't, they're hiding in plain sight. Lots of dojis today signaling potential turning point. So when you have a sell-off that terminates in a doji, that means it's going to go up. No, it means it could and you only have a small region of uncertainty, but it also means it could do that because it just did that, it could do that again. So a doji is a critical state ready to go large in either direction. You cannot have a directional bias or you are hesitating when it goes the other way. You don't want to be surprised, you want to follow price. You cannot be surprised if price leaves the doji, it doesn't matter which direction. Apple was the big breakdown today. It wasn't a big breakdown, but it was a breakdown. This is why you got to be ready to crush Tesla. It's the worst performer on all of the look back periods. So when it starts failing intraday, that's telling you nobody's buying. Lots of auto framers. 
in the ETFs, lots of dojis. This is a turning point. Bear quiet. Is it going to wake up and rip people's faces off of, or is it going to go back to sleep and let us sneak out with the treasure? I don't know. Let's see. Standard squeezes and frames. Some quiet Godzillas in the S&P. None in the tactical symbol set. This is how quiet it was today. The one the one day movers in the S and P, there were only four out of five hundred symbols that had a larger a significantly large one day move. Four hundred and ninety six were within normal or extremely quiet. All of the most quiet ones were universally quiet on both one day and five day. That is not a recipe for an enraged bear. I mean, it could happen, but that doesn't feel like enraged selling or panic selling, does it? Very little volatility today. All right, that's everything we got for today. We'll get this published and posted. And thanks for your kind attention.